Say that again. I said the number one question most people ask or is like the bug poop. What happens with bug poop and, um, you know, the, the actual carcasses as well, I would guess, the bugs. Mm. Right. So, obviously, or maybe it's not obvious if people are asking the question. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfectly. Okay, cool. Um, no, that's a totally reasonable question in my opinion. I'm glad that people think about these sorts of things, you know, like what's going on? What's going on with my food? What's going on with my cannabis? All that. Um, the answer is that generally speaking, predatory mites, they're not, they really don't like to be around the, um, the trichomes of, of a plant, any plant, the hairy, the hairy trichomes are, they tend, they tend to be, if they're globular, if they tend to be the kinds of trichomes that secrete something, uh, those tend to be defensive compounds that will affect the way the mite is able to hunt and seek and, and live. So they're not going to want to go up. So the reason I say that is because they're generally not going to want to go up into your calyx, into where all the trichomes are going to be. You know what I mean? Correct, yeah. No, I've, I've seen it. You don't have to, yeah. You, I've, I've totally seen it oh, as yeah. well. Even where you lease them, when you're week two or three and you just start to see trichomes being formed on the buds, the bud, the actual predator mites really don't go into that area at all. Right. Now, if you were to, like, sprinkle them on there, obviously that's a totally different question, but that's not what you're supposed to do. So if that yeah, does in happen... In, in vegetative status, in vegetative status, sprinkling them on is fine, but you're not actually in the right. production of cannabis at that point. Right, yeah. And... Um, uh, you know, so they're definitely going to be in and around the plant, but they're not going to go up into the calyx. Um, you know, another thing that we could, that somebody can do is for like spider mites, they can use, um, uh, like, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the species name. I can't believe this. Pressure's on. But, um, there's a, there's a ladybird beetle that eats, um, spider mites, two spot spider mites, and they're bigger. So in a way, you might, somebody might want to choose that if they're worried, if they're really concerned that something's going to go up into their calyx. You can see the ladybug, it's, it's big. You could like, like, oh, that's obviously on my, on my product, you know? Yeah. So as a quality assurance, you could just either, either pick them off or just actually see them and shake them off or into that type of nature. Sure. Um, yeah, one of the other questions is, is, uh, and I've tried to explain this before, but you, you seem, you could probably explain it more in a scientific term. Um, when predator mites are actually usable and when they're not usable. Like, um, for example, <clears throat> I've been in the understanding after about week or four or five of flower when the, when the bud is really getting dense, mm. you can't, if you have mites, predator mites really are not going to help at that point. It's pretty much a too late of a, of a, of a, of a, you know, a cycle or basically in, in, in the actual flower, uh, room itself. I would say that it depends on the mite and what, and what you're uh, or what you're trying to get rid of. Um, you probably don't get much white fly, so you probably wouldn't have to worry about that. But if you are dealing with two spot spider mite, or and, and if those two spot spider mites, you see when their population gets big, they'll um, they like to what's called balloon, and spiders do this too. Some spiders do this, which is where they go up to the highest point they can. And you've probably seen it where they colonize the bud and there's there's a webbing everywhere. And so they release silk and those are the young ones and the old ones do. And it allows and the the air, the wind pulls them off. So it's kinda like a a passive way of moving. And they're migrating point, basically. They're migrating. Yeah. Yeah, basically, and, and that's gonna, you know, at that point you don't want to use your predatory mites. But if they if you don't have that situation, then perhaps so. If you only see them on your leaves, perhaps you know. But you're you're right that you would probably want to be maybe even if the even if the mites could work, you might want to try to do something that's quicker. Exactly. So. Exactly. Exactly. And that's another thing um, that I've tried to. Try explain to people too is is mites are great but if it's kind of an infestation like you are literally just covered in mites everywhere you know fi even just physically removing them with a vacuum or even wiping the plant down with just water and soap or anything like that 
to get these things off before you release your predator mites to just, you know, it's kind of like dropping a nuke before you put in the, you know, the military, for example. Right. Um, it's okay. the best one. You know, yeah. People, well, this is the thing is people, I, I've had a lot of people ask, well, I've used mites, but I failed, right? Mm -hmm. And it's most likely the population, at least in my logical sense, that population was out of control to compare to what he actually released in predator mites. I mean, who knows? It could be a billion. It could be a ton of reasons why it might fail. Um, I, I always, whenever I ask, um, or whenever someone asks me a question like that's very broad, very you know, I have to say like, hey, the big, the devil's in the details. I have to ask like twenty questions to like know what your situation is first before saying something makes more sense. Because that's part of integrated pest management too. Um, if you know that you are going to harvest soon, or if you know that. Yeah, like you said, you're too far into the flowering phase. Um, you know, biocontrol, or at least predatory mite biocontrol, might not be the correct option, and that's okay. Sometimes it makes more sense to just cut some things off. Like, that's totally legitimate. Exactly, exactly. Physically remove plants. I mean, I had to do it when I had russets. The only way I would have got rid of russets, I'm sure, is physically removing the most infested plants and getting them out of the room. That's actually a really popular way to get rid of things, even in, like, aloe. Uh, there's a russet mite called aloe mite. That's kind of like that. Basically, like the I went to a, a workshop. Um, it's got to be a year and a half ago now, and they were just talking about how basically one of the only treatments they they said were really good were just cull, just get rid of the plants that, yeah, that are infested. Yeah, yeah, it's just the best option at that point. You can replace. Um, uh, one of the interesting questions were banker plants. Do you want to? Can you talk about banker plants at all, or how to? Or somebody was asking, is it possible to grow your own? Uh, mites and actually, you know, keep mites instead of rep you know, repetitively buying them over and over as a recurring cost. Oh, I see. Not probably at the at the level that people would want. Um, so, but like ambiently, like on your property, yeah, probably. Yeah, you could definitely. Um, you could. You can. Well, there's a couple of ways I could answer this question, but essentially, it's yes, but in a couple of different ways. So, like for example, I've heard. And I and I've I've heard from people who 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 sell like hypoaspis miles um, or the uh, the predatory soil mite that people like so much um, that if you top basically if you top dress your substrate with um, bran and baker's yeast or brewer's yep. yeast um, that the uh, that that sort of con that sort of mixture will be conducive to the um, predatory mice, and the understanding that I have is that they'll eat the yeast in the so bread. It's, it's a natural food for them to be around, anyways. Exactly, because they're detrivores too. So they'll eat they'll eat the the pest, whether it's a thrips pupa or um, whatever, and then they'll also be able to sustain themselves on the alternative food source that they normally would eat, anyways. And so you can kind of it'll keep them around longer. Just like just like somebody feeds deer or whatever, you you put you put food out, deer natural predators are going to come around. I have bird seed, I have birds everywhere. Just have bird seed around. Right. Um, another thing that people like to do is make a, like like you said a banker crop or a banker um, uh, a buffer, which can be good depending on if you're if you're just growing cannabis. I mean that's one thing, um, but people like to also use it in agricultural context too. Um, and push pull and that kind of thing. Uh, I was just making a post recently about people using uh, tiger beetles because some they're they're carnivores, but some of them also eat like weed seeds. Not weed seeds, but you know weedy seeds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeds you do not want in your crop, right? And um, you know it was called. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the uh, the many hammers solution, I think, or the many hammers technique, where you have a bunch of little beetles that you cultivate and all these other organisms that come and take care of it for you and you don't have to worry about it it's like a passive control that way but you know uh, just because you create such a such a buffer you know sometimes your exact location or your microclimate or something you know it might not you might not be as successful as you want it to be but it's definitely a um it's a legitimate technique it just you know it doesn't always work yeah, 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 I got you, I got you. Um, what about mite, uh, how long do they live? That's another big, huge question. Mm -hmm. If I release mites, um, well, you can probably talk about the two different forms that at least I get them in. I get them in satchels or I'll get them, um, you know, live. Um, yeah. And 
one of one of the biggest misconceptions is with those hatches. They'll, they'll people will actually cut them open and, and use them. Yeah, like they're alive already, and it's like no, 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 that's not how it works. So right. I think we probably want to talk about that for a minute, and then live mites. And once they are live, how long do they last? If there's food, um, one of the other questions are: Will they actually uh, lay eggs in your room and mm. self provide? Like, if there's enough food for them, will they actually start laying eggs and reproducing themselves? All great questions. Um, yes, they do reproduce in crop. They typically do. Um, and the amount of time that they last is, is, is actually very species dependent. Mm -hmm. I made a video on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, where I go over um, different mites that you could use to um, control Tetranicus ursae, the two-spot spider mite. And, you know, you might choose one mite because it, I, I think it was Andersoni, I want to say it was Andersoni, that was the uh, mite, it, uh, in a, I was looking at it's, it's what's called life table, which is the amount of time, it, like for one generation. And um, it, li it can live for over 100 days, which is, oh, wow. which is way longer, I mean, under these optimal conditions that they were cultivating them under, but with the right food and the right environment, they were able, they were able to survive way longer than other mites uh, that would be uh, targeting the same pest. On the other hand, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're better, but that could be that could really go and uh, that could go one way and help you if if you're in the right climate. Maybe it makes more sense to use one or the other. One's more expensive or less expensive, right? And then for the sachets. Um, uh, so, like, generally speaking, like, I'm very familiar with, like, Copert's or Copert's uh, sachet um, for, like, Amblyseus swirskii, and, um, yeah, you don't want to cut that because it, they're usually made in such a special way that um, they have, like, a pinprick, and it's got it's the right humidity and the right um, feeder mites that are inside and all that stuff, and um, you've... Uh, you don't want to cut it off because then everything dries out, all the feeder mites go out. Also, you don't want to put your sachets in a direct sunlight because the sunlight will heat everything up and then everything will want to get out. Um, the way that the sachets typically work is that they've got a um, they've got a blend of the feeder mites and the non-feeder mites, the predatory mites, and they feed and reproduce in there. And the feeder mites are, are typically... Um, they will reproduce faster, so it's kind of like they're always playing catch-up. So the predatory mites, as they bulk up and there's, their population ex, uh, expands, um, they naturally don't want to be where everyone else is. They're going to try to get out of there. And so they you take advantage of that natural inclination to disperse by having that little pinprick, and so they're always passively coming out. And I've been quoted mm -hmm. that they'll last for 10 weeks, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it's only six weeks, like... Yeah, um, bio, not biotactics, uh, the people that I order from, uh, they say anywhere from four to six. Okay, see, there they, you go. And he's, yeah, they say the humidity is the biggest key and the factor in these mites lasting and how long those, those whatever they're called, the little packets of eggs and stuff and all that. He oh, said yeah, that yeah. Humidity, humidity in the room is a key thing. If you don't keep it over 60 to 60% 60 humidity, relative humidity, that the mites, specifically to uh, the ones that I actually are using anyways, because I'm, I, uh, I know for a fact, I, or at least I've read that mites also, depending on the uh, humidity that you have, certain mites are more effective than others. I would say that definitely um, humidity is a, is a huge critical factor for these mites, for predatory mites and arthropods in general. If it's too dry, they're just going to just gonna crumple. <laughs> they're just going to dry out and desiccate. Yeah. Uh, but the way, that it, the way that it feels like in relative humidity and absolute humidity, like right next to the leaves and things like that, the microclimate can be significantly different. Um, like, for example, if you just watered, like, so right next to where the soil is, obviously it's going to be more humid and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, you want, like, I know that some are more tolerant than others to, like, certain temperatures and certain humidities. And if we want to get really technical, different cultures of mites are probably going to have differences there, too. Like, for example, I know that, again, copper, for example, I think they... Um, didn't in their original cultures didn't originally have this, but they were able to breed 
their mites to not go through what's called diapause, um, which would be kind of like overwintering, sort of like a seasonal slumber. And, um, like hibernation almost. Basically. And so they weren't able, and so they were able to breed a culture that doesn't do that anymore. And so you could, and so it's, it's very common, in fact, to see, to find, um, sort of like you can see like, like the different cultures, kind of like, you know, pheno hunting almost, but it's predatory mites. And some of them are better in this climate or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what you should put to rest because that's what made me just have the aha moment with you is when the, uh, when I posted about the, the, the CHP releasing mites okay. for uh, star, uh, star thistle, and right. then you explained to me that most likely the, the mites that they released were uh, host-specific mm. to um, the crop that they were trying to kill and, uh, and how, how you actually know what type of russet you have. A lot of these guys probably don't realize there's, I think you told me there's like 500 different types. There's like 5,000. 5,000, yeah. It's like 5,000, yeah. Well, it, it's, um, there's a really great study, and I'd be, and I'd, and, oh, and I should probably mention this just for anyone who's on the feed. If, if at any time, um, maybe you're like, oh, can I get more information on that? Or if, or if you do yourself, um, I'd be happy to send you uh, the cited sources of what I'm talking about. So exactly. that you can that's why, know for sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, that's the only way I deal with things. If, if there's an actual, you know, peer reviewed mm -hmm. study or something people have actually done the research it's not just here too that's how <laughs> i feel about it too so um, i'd be happy to send it to anyone who's interested just send me a message i'd be i'd be happy to send it but to answer your question right um there's a great there's a great research report i'm blanking on the name but i know where it is on my on my um computer and it talks about how they basically they just left out trays of water on a skyscraper and because these mites, they're so small and microscopic, they get swept up into the into the atmosphere as as what I like to call aeroplankton. Not just me, but other people do. But this aeroplankton is aphids, thrips, um, obviously spores, anything that can get you know that's really small and tiny and tossed and, uh, up in here, yeah. get tossed up. Yeah. And so in this research report, they basically were able to isolate like like at that time there were only like two thousand known species, which is still a lot. Um, not all of them are described, but after this report, they got like the other 3,000 just from this one thing and just by leaving out the trays. So, because the, the mites would just um, get into the water and, and they, they get would stuck. die. It. Just like a sticky trap. trap. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, um, I bring that up because they're not all described, so it's possible that maybe far in the future, Maybe we'll find because there are some russet mites that are not host specific, but they're not generalists. They if they aren't host specific to one species, they may be they will maybe consume another species. Maybe well, maybe out of, for out of survival, basically, correct? Yeah, like as an alternative food source when they're starving. A and um, so, like for example, uh, tomato russet mite. Which, oh, I have to say, sorry, I have to. When vegans break down and eat meat, player. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what it comes down to. We're surviving in this. <laughs> well, it's true. Well, you know, um, there's a there's a ladybug that eats uh, scale, uh, or um, yeah, scale or mealybug, a mealybug destroyer. But if it if you put it in a situation where it doesn't have its natural food source, it'll eat aphids. But that doesn't mean that it no, controls exactly. them. You know exactly. Exactly. It doesn't want them, but it's it's going to survive. So Loud asked yeah. a really good question, and I want to know this too because I actually don't need the amount that I can minimally, minimally order. So can you store the satchels or sachets or whatever in the fridge and, and keep them longer than you need them? It's really not recommended. Okay. So basically, yeah. once you get them in, you need to use them or, or, or they're going to not be any good. The best time to use them is immediately when you get them. Um, I have... I have had experience keeping them f for longer than that for reasons that had nothing to do with us or it's just logistical problems. And they yeah, still yeah. work for like a, a day or two, but like that's pushing it. Um, and the, re the reason for it is because there are a bunch of tiny bodies respirating and um, the cold helps slow down their metabolism, 
but yeah, exactly. eventually, if they're not in a cold place or if they're in too cold a place, that's that's also going to be a problem. You know, it's just you're playing, you're kind of rolling the dice. Yeah, yep, yep. So we're gonna go loud. Um, uh, like if I didn't answer team. your question about the. I, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, go ahead. But go ahead. I didn't answer your question about the um, the Caltrans thing, though. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. please, please, please. Yeah, I was just. I'm sorry for being long winded, but um, uh, the uh, so anyways, there's a there's a. It, it's pretty well known, pretty well established that aerophyid mites, which are russet mites, um, are pretty host specific. In like nine times out of ten, you need to know basically. Unless you're an acrologist who has the keys and everything, which most people aren't, I'm not. Um, you know, then you can't really tell the difference. You have to know what host it was on. That will really tell you what it, what it, what it was on and what what kind of mite it is. So unless um, you're unless you're scoping that exact mite, you're not going to know. Pretty much, unless you see it on like if it's on tomato, tomato is going to be tomato or something. Mite. If it's on your hemp, it's on your cannabis. Hemp russet mite. It's on aloe. Aloe russet mite is how they got their names because that's what they're on only, pretty much. Um, and uh, so for the Caltrans thing, they were they're using they were trying to use. They're actually there's a there's a form people like to cite when they mention what you what you mentioned to me as like evidence that they're putting out um, hemp russet mite. But it's a really easy thing. You can just go on the document and you go to the um, the picture is of an aerophyid. But you just go on the caption and you see it's a seria, which is not the same genus as the hemp russet mite, which is aculops. So it's so, not even close. It's not even well, it's related, but it would be, you know, like a chihuahua versus, uh, uh, you know, a, a big dog. It's just yeah. completely different. Yeah, it's not the same thing at all. And um, and uh, then other people were also mentioning they were thinking that broad mite was also being released. But man, that would be sh not that the government doesn't do this. You know, but it would be a incredible, it would be incredibly terrible idea, and you would shoot yourself in the foot agriculturally. To, to if you were trying to surreptitiously undermine cannabis, I feel like there were, there would be like much smarter ways of doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I uh, somebody sent me an article one time uh, about in Florida they were going to want to release actual PM mm. spores to deal with some of the. Uh, you know, some of the illegal grows are out there, but the, you're right. The farmers came forward and said, Hey, 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 if you guys do this, you're going to affect microclimates. You're going to affect everything. Like you mm -hmm. don't know what you're doing. Leave it alone. Like let nature do its own thing. Um, so that's why I think a lot of people don't realize either is it's all, it all intertwines. You can't really just, you know, release something. And no, it. It, you're right. You're right. And I think I'd heard something about, um, I think people called it, Agent Green or Green Agent or something like that, and it was like a fusarium that they were yeah. tr that they had cultured intentionally or that they had found. Had I can't remember all the details, but my understanding is that it was an idea that was proposed. It got pretty far experimentally, but then never went past that, as far as we know. And I'm not a conspiratorial type person. I really want to see the evidence yeah, but of that, but but there's definitely evidence of the experimentation. So I mean, right. like yeah, that, that's at least plausible, you know. That they actually did research it. It doesn't mean that yeah. they released it. They did research and see if they could do it. And honestly, I'll tell you what, especially with the fusarium like species complex, like uh, with a lot of a lot of microbes, they can transfer genes horizontally. So like if you had the fusarium, for example, it, it's possible in some cases where the like the genes that allow that organism to infect, you know, whatever plant, perhaps is specific to the, that plant, uh, it might just give those to a whole other colony, a whole, whole other species. They're both fusarium, and they're both very, very close, closely related. And then you might have other fusarium that now can infect even better the cannabis plant or whatever plant that, for example, you're you're trying to make, you're trying to give this to. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Um, what's another, man, does anybody else have any uh, other questions? I mean, this is, uh, you know. <laughs> I, know there was, I know there was somebody who asked about, um, somebody asked about whether it's in the winter time if he's got his, uh, yes, or very if, good. Yeah, if they've got their, um, grow the way that it is, um, 
and uh, they had spider mites. I think they, they cut, they harvested, and they're worried that they might have spider mites again. And it's winter time, so they're wondering if they were dormant. And, um, you know, it depends on what mites. I, I assume he means spider mites, and if that's what they meant, then um, they probably are dormant. I mean, they're going to come again, like, like, or, you know, otherwise we'd have no pests because they'd all die um, after one season. So they, they have ways of, of kind of eking out their existence. Um, Aerophyte mites, for example, they, uh, they, they produce a special form, a special female form that is meant to, to overwinter. So... So they actually know it's coming. They know it's coming, and they're getting ready for the winter, basically. Yeah, exactly. And you only need one. You only need one of those to get onto your plant, and your you can have a population spring up. Yeah, one female. Uh, one other big question. I know I'm, I thought about it while you were talking. Uh, uh, for your feeding uh, with predatory mites, um, and then sprays. Are are there any sprays? I don't spray anything at all. Ever since I started doing mites, predator mites, I just it's something I don't need to do anymore. They're just not there. Um, Good. But if if you do want to spray or you want to be like overprotecting as an IPM, can you, would you recommend like uh, Grandiva or any of those biologicals or are they actually killing uh, predator mites as well? Oh, that's a good question. I'm, and I'm also glad that people ask that question because I, I also get a ton of people who think, oh, well, it's, it's a beneficial spray, so it's going to be beneficial 100% of the time. But like, they're both mites. You know, exactly. but um, but to answer your question, generally speaking, there's not a whole lot of of like uh, antagonism between most most microbial sprays and predatory mites. Um, I would say that like, like I like to use I always talk about it like Bouveria Bassiana products, so Botanigard, Microtrol. Um, there's a few others I think, and um, th those there's a great study that I saw that was really intriguing, but I don't, you wouldn't be able to do it in America, but it's, it's European, where they, where they, um, or I think that's the case, I might be mixing my studies. Anyways, my point being is that they were able to, they put the spores of the Bouveria bastiana on Swirsky mites, and then they had the Swirsky mites crawl up and down this plant, and when they crawled over these scale insects, because um, they don't move anywhere, but the mites are always moving. They deposit the spores every time they walk over them, and then the spores grew on the scale, and they were like a vector. And yeah, they're basically they're like yeah, they were basically delivering the uh, the uh, fungicide to them, or not the, fu the right. pesticide to them. Exactly, exactly. And um, they t they wanted to test because you can because Bouveria bassiana does infect mites. It, do it affects most uh, like seven hundred different arthropods. Um, and so uh, they found that there was like a 12% mortality or something with the Swirsky mites, which I guess wasn't a whole lot. I want to say that was it was like 12%, but the 12% doesn't mean anything without context. So Yeah, it could uh, have been they drowned. They, it could have been that, that that mite naturally died anyways. It was going to die. They do it barely by count, I'm sure, huh? Yeah, I can't remember at this point. I think it was, um, but I think they also tried to find, like, they, they wanted to verify if um, mycosis or, like, actual death from the fungus happened. Um, yeah, so I think did, it like, was autopsy on the mite. Yeah, something, something like, because they had a very controlled room, so I imagine that they can, um, that, that, if, that, they're, that they're observing one plant. I want to say it was, um, gosh, I forget. Not mango, but like I want to say it's like a tropical. It was like a tropical fruit plant, so it wasn't like cannabis, for example. Um, but yeah, they were they were able to because they knew, they knew how many mites they were putting out, I think, and they were able to tell um, given the given the uh, the plants in the pot how uh, you know where are the mites when they're dead and um, yeah. Um, what about? Uh, uh, and I don't know if you don't know, you know, don't, I wouldn't expect you to answer. But what about with uh, 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 mites and being become immune or like a super mite, for example? Um, do you know much about that or, or how that happens? A lot of people ask that all the time. Like, how do I, if I'm spraying, for example, I was spraying Grandivo, Venerate every three days, like, like clockwork, okay? Mm -hmm. I still got russet mites. 
It didn't matter. They, they blew up out of control. So did I actually have a, a russet mite that was completely immune to these two products? Or uh, was I just not killing them off faster than they, they were breeding? Or, you know, what takes place for that to happen? Because I know a lot of growers, cannabis growers specifically, that they'll spray, they'll spray, they'll spray. And basically all they're doing is controlling their population. They're not eliminating those mites, if that makes sense. So they'll spray, spray, spray till week three or four of uh, their crop, like normal people that spray do. And then they'll stop and they'll just let it finish out. But at the end of the, at the, end of the cannabis, there's always mites that pop up. It's like they never actually killed them off. Mm. Because I always, I always tell people, from my experience anyways, if I have mites, they don't come, like you don't have mites, week, you don't get mites week four and then have an infestation by the end of the cycle, if that makes sense. It just mm -hmm. does not happen that fast. So you right. have these already prior to this week or whatever that you stop spraying. You've just never actually killed that population down. Um, and that's why I was turned on to the predator mites because literally you can't get immune to being excuse the term, effed off. I mean, they're literally eating you alive. So it's, it is what it is, you know. Um, do you know anything about, you know, how, to, how, those, how that happens? What's the most common way for people to cause that type of stuff? Yeah, um, I do. And you've actually kind of touched on a couple of different subjects with that. Um, but to start off um, with spider mites, not that anyone should be using these products. <clears throat> But you can induce what's called a, a hormoligotic effect. Um, hormesis or hormoligosis is the, um, it's what doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. But it's Correct, literally yeah. that's the definition, basically. And, um, but it's more like you get a sublethal, because it's a poison, and if they got the lethal dose, it would kill them. So it's definitely not great for them. It's not like, you know, but it's kind of like being bitten by a radioactive spider. It's like, the um, the the spray, and we don't really understand why, but the, something about the ex, the stress that it has on their physiology, like imidacloprid, for example, which is a neonicotinoid. People shouldn't be using it in their cannabis. It's systemic, you know. But just as an example, ca there are chemical agents that can induce this effect in spider mites, for example. And there's research reports um, that clearly state that, and other chemicals too. But they're all chemicals people shouldn't be using microbial sprays not to my knowledge i can't think of any reason why really? that would be possible really not to my knowledge yeah so i it's just i just was not spraying the right amount or the specific microbials that i was using probably were not effective for that species of russet perhaps we would have to look at it you'd have to really do a, a study again study and test it and actually know yeah <laughs> yeah and, and i also want to say that it's also possible for somebody to be spraying everything correctly and, like, maybe there's something wrong with, it. like, you know, uh, I have a very funny anecdote that I don't want to, I don't want to bogart our time too much, but basically the long and the short of it was the problem, they were trying to use uh, nematodes, and the problem was that the people who were applying them, there was a little, there was a screen mesh that's inside their dositron or whatever, yeah, so they were just... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and nobody and nobody thought about it. No, everyone's like, "Well, I'm doing my job fine," and nobody wanted to talk about it. Everybody was very, you know, like, "I didn't do anything wrong," and he, they didn't. They just didn't think about, you know, that small detail. So you never know. It could be something like in your nozzle. It could be, it could be that they were just all around, or or maybe like people around. I don't know if people grow around you, but like that's another big oh, thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah, the whole regiment. Right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's the whole regiment. It's, it's pretty prevalent yeah. around here. <laughs> that's probably uh, the, that's probably the problem. That's probably the problem. <laughs> let, uh, does anybody else have any questions, or if, if if he knows something that people ask a lot, I'll let him talk. Um, yeah, well, I know Flight Club. I know a lot of the reasons. That's why I went to the mites. The mites track those suckers down. I mean, what's really cool about predator mites, too, and I'll talk about this, is I've seen them leave plant and hunt off of the plant. Like, they're just looking for food. They don't yeah, care they're always the seeking. Yeah, yeah, they don't care where the food is. Um, in your recommendation, here's, here's one. Uh, what's the best mite? Like, if your target's... You know you have two spotted mites, right? You okay. know you have two spotted spider mites. 
-hmm. In your opinion, what would be the best mite to eliminate those suckers? I have been told the Cal California promiscuous, I think is what it's called, California kiss promiscuous. Oh, I think you're mixing up two different mites. It's uh, phyto it's Phytocilius persimilis, that's the red mite, and then there's yes. um and, and then there's a uh, oh, they changed the genus on me. I, f I keep forgetting which one it is. I think Neostilius cu cucumeris or Californicus. Yeah. Californicus, that's the one. Cal yeah. Californicus. Yeah, and so uh, Phytocilius persimilis or the persimilis mite is is the is the king. That's the king mite for for two Those spots, spider like, mite. They're like wolves, man. They really are. They're amazing well, to watch. Yeah, they are. Aren't they uh, they're they're specialists. They don't eat any other kind of mite. Um, there's a good. I like to share this particular report with people because I think it helps them kind of characterize. Like if they never took like a biology degree or anything, or and. Uh, or this team of people, they uh, organize a bunch of phyto, what are called phytoseed mites, most of which are, are the group that our predatory mites fall under. And they were able to organize them into uh, types, from type 1 to type, I want to say, 6 now. And uh, if you and the the last two, 5 and 6, are about what environments they're good at. But 1 through 4 is 1... Super specialized on tetranikids, spider mites. And four is super generalist, uh, omnivorous um, kind of mite. So your Swirsky is more on the type four. Your Persimilis is type one. So yeah, it's true that like your generalist might eat some spider mites, but that's not what it's designed, evolved to specifically go after. Persimilis right. is... Yep, yep. Yeah. What about, somebody was asking about russet and rods now. Hmm. For russet and broad mites, what, what do you think for target specific? Oh, okay. I see. I'm sorry. Now I understand. Yeah, um, there are a couple of different options. I would say that probably the one I like to use, it's funny because whenever I talk to other people, a lot of people would say um, Andersoni, or not Andersoni, um, what? I, I, I've been told Squirskies. Are the best. Yeah, that's what I use. That's what I use. For, 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 for preventative, for a preventative of those two specifics, because I guess they're, like you said, they're generalists, but they will also eat broads and they will also eat yeah. um, russet. So if you have either or, they're a great preventative. I actually, that was, that's where I was going with this. That's the one that I like to recommend. Um, I can't remember the one that everyone else says for some reason, but. Um, they're also, I don't get oscillus, oscillus or something like that. Oh, oxygen, 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 occidentalis, occidentalis. I think that's I think. the one that I was told, and I I didn't have very good luck with them. Uh, okay. I still noticed uh, uh, russet mites, but the I the squirskies seem to really just they're gone. You know, they're not my around anymore. My favorite, re well, one of the good reasons I like to use Swirsky, we're Swirsky guys because not only like because like we just said they're generalists, right? So they'll go after your thrips too. Right, they'll go after your. Um, they'll they'll go a little bit. They're definitely not a curative, but they will go after a little bit. Some some two spot spider mite. They'll 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 eat a couple of eggs. They'll eat a couple of adults. Um, but yeah, they'll go after white fly. If you have white fly, they'll go after um, your rest of mite, obviously. So they're kind of like they're a nice uh, sort of general pro prophylactic. And then on top of that, um, there's uh, products that you can get to for feeding them. Uh, like Nutramite, for example, which is, um, it's cattail pollen. Oh, you got to get me on this stuff. I'm sure I could put this in my room right now. Yeah, so it's it's called, uh, the only product I know that I'm not trying to like, um, I don't get any kickbacks or nothing, but Nutramite, I just got to say it because some people, everyone's always like, <laughs> I don't know, but Nutramite, Nutramite's a pollen, it's um, cattail, cattail pollen, and uh, these generalist mites eat pollen. And so, um, but so do thrips. So I've heard sometimes people like to say that if you spray it, you're going to attract thrips. I don't think you would attract thrips, but maybe if you already had a population, you might risk feeding them well, a little for, bit. For an indoor bedroom, if you're indoors, for example, in a bedroom and you wanted to keep a population alive. Yeah, I would. You know, you could spray them and it wouldn't, you wouldn't, have, I, mean, I don't know how you're going to get thrips in there. They're not going to migrate inside really. And obviously you could bring them in. Well, it's, yeah, be, well, it's it not going to, yeah, it's not, well, my, that's my point, it's not going to attract them. If they're already there, or if they're going to be there, then 
that's a different that's a different thing happening. But you're right, and also your Swirsky are going to be there. Um, so I and in my experience, when I use a, a prophylactic like that, like the pollen for the Swirsky, oh man, they love it. They uh, I notice that their fecundity increases. There, I see a ton of eggs everywhere. Um, I've got so it's like it's like e, it's like ecstasy. They just want to have fun and and, and get down and, and make more babies. It's like <laughs> it's like imagine it's like imagine us pre-industrial times where we don't always know what our next meal is going to be, and then suddenly food rains from the sky. It's like time to party, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I not somebody else was saying good good questions. I'm going to look back. Hold on, give me a second. Um, it's fine to spray foyer food, you would think, or do you think it kills a lot of mites? That's one thing that always, like if people want to foyer kelp or they want to foyer silica, well, I know a lot of people foyer silica and kelp is why. I see. Yeah, um, well, those can, I would say that you do run the risk a little bit of like, of hurting some them. mites. You know, but like if if you you know again, that's where it comes from. Like the, I gotta know like what your what your growth system is like, what your environment, what you're trying to do, like what your goals are. Because uh, for some people, for a lot of people, um, what biocontrols they use is uh, in a lot of ways directed by how much money they have to spend on them. And um, so if they don't. So for some people, they want to make sure they get as much out of it as possible. For other people, they can afford to like have that you know small uh, antagonistic effect of doing a foliar feed or potentially harming like a sachet if it gets waterlogged or something like that, you know. But um, you know, it's not the same as like using a miticide or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Yeah, I mean once a week, tw twice a week to spray. Yeah. Spray your face yeah. Exactly. Like if you're, and you know, if it's like a light spray, you're not deluging your plants. You know, it's probably fine. All right. Um, well, you're also you deal with uh, PM and stuff. What would what would you you want to explain PM and why people get PM? I I know why the main person why main mainly people get PM. But go ahead and explain for all the people that think it has to do with you have high humidity or something of that nature, please explain PM and how PM works and how prevalent PM spores are and all of that type of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're probably breathing them in right now. Like all, you know, <laughs> uh, I think I've heard, I think I've heard it quoted or I've, I've heard it said something like every breath, you're probably inhaling 80 spores at the minimum, like just ambient spores everywhere unless you're living in a clean room i'm not sure how true that is and i might be recalling it wrong but these spores are everywhere they're ubiquitous and powdery mildew so actually believe it or not powdery mildew does not like water but botrytis does so really you're, I, if you're <laughs> i know you just go just go on i'm not, I'm not gonna say shit i'm just gonna i'm gonna yeah. actually pull the ball i'm gonna pack a bowl on this one Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like if you're trying to fight the one, you're gonna kind of enable the other. I, I, that's always been, that's been my experience sometimes. Um, and, and the only time it hasn't been that experience, if I, if it, I just happen to be working with a grow that, um, like just doesn't get that for a reason I don't have any idea. You know, lucky them, right? But um, so powdery mildew spores, they get onto your leaves or or whatever material. Um, if it, if the powdery mildew, so like, yes, certain species are not going to infect other plant species. Um, there are going to be species that are um, specific to cannabis, and uh, so so obviously we're talking about those species. If that gets onto your plant, then uh, the spore will um, a little tendril will come out, and it will oppressorate, or it will uh, it'll it'll make a little pin that it will push into the plant, it'll, it'll uh, exude enzymes that will break down the waxy outer layer, the, um, the uh, mesophyll, the, uh, all, everything just to get to the good cellular insides. And then what will happen is, is it'll just siphon out um, food from the cells. And, it, and then it'll grow along as an epiphyte, it will grow along the surface of the leaf. 
So it's not, as a lot of people like to say, it's not systemic. Um, it can go, it can go a little bit into the plant, but it's not like it's not like pieces are like breaking off and like um, kind of like how like a, like cancer, you know, could like yeah. break. Well, this is what most people think is like it actually goes into the cell, it becomes part of the cell, and then uh. it's passed down generation after generation. And I have to explain to people that's not how this works. Right. Like, ex ex exactly what you're saying is, you know, you're going, you know, just, just, yeah, you're already doing it. Don't worry. Oh yeah, no, I appreciate that. I was, I um, yeah. So that's called. So, so some pathogens do that. Some pathogens can be ver what's called um, vertically transmitted. Horizontal transmission is like I get sick, I cough on you, you get sick. Vertical transmission is like. Um, I'm pregnant, I'm going to have my kid, but I also have a disease, and that disease will be passed on to my child. You know, and, and obviously, if you're a pathogen, that's what you want. That'll guarantee you, it'll guarantee that you're going to have food for your, for your next, um, your next uh, offspring, your progeny. But m a lot of organisms have not, have not evolved, a lot of pathogens haven't evolved to do that. Um, but some have, not powdery mildew, though. Yeah, exactly. Um, what what's the what's the ideal climate, or what what actually causes those spores to you know to take hold on a plant? Um, because if it's yeah, everywhere, yeah. for example, um, and you know, I've always just dealt with the three big things. That I've you know, they don't like a lot of light. PM does not like high high uh, light. No, um, does not like fresh air. It wants stagnant area, like it wants to just be able to be there. It doesn't want to be messed with. Right. Um, uh, and the, and uh, temperature swings, for whatever reason, creating a... Uh, 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 I don't know if it's humidity that I've seen, but it's a temperature thing. Where if, you're, if your room swings, say, for example, you have a 90-degree room because you're, you're under a seed, and then at night it drops to 60 Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of these type of rooms have issues, but it may be actual just again back to plant health It's not really healthy for that plant to be sitting in a 90 and then 60 90 60 90 60 type of um, Yeah, I think there's I think there's a there's like three or there's like three or four things that's happening with that so um, It's kind of like it's kind of like the same thing that happens with plants and uh, seasonal changes their bodies are they have adapted to uh, be, they have certain traits that are plastic, which means that they are sensitive to the environment, and um, and they change depending on their environment. And so, you know, like when the, when it gets hotter, they're like, oh, it's time for me to go into flower and do my seeds. Same thing with this uh, temperature swing or a humidity spike will indicate to the organism, this is my time. This is my time to go. Um, but like again, most of that's going to be that's going to be happening at the microclimate level. So um, it's kind of hard to track that. Generally speaking, though, I think in most cases the powdery mildew that you encounter is going to be able to like it's it's more of a question of how fast it's going to grow rather than if it will or not. Generally speaking, and it's, and it's normally. Uh, uh like, like, exam, exam, oh, god dang, I just had a stroke or something. With russet mites, uh, uh, it's generally gene-specific or plant-specific. So when you get PM on a cannabis plant, that PM or that uh, type of fungus is for cannabis specifically. That's right. In, uh, in phytopathologists do this thing. Did I, inter did I interrupt you? No, 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 you're good. Okay. So, um, so there is there is this thing in uh, in phytopathology called, um, oh, I forget now. I keep doing that, but basically, it's called it's like non oh yeah non host resistance. So that's when you give you put a pathogen on a plant that you know is not its host, and the plant resists it. That's like level zero. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, it, you I mean, I have. There's people like I know people have PM on their property and they won't have it in their room at all. I have I have a plant. Sure. I think it's like a uh, it's a um, crepe myrtle. It gets PM all the time. Hmm. Yeah. I, no, I, I I uh, I um I was dealing with some powdery mildew on some samples of Gerber leaves, and they don't infect the um, ice cream bean seedlings that I'm growing. 
it's right next to each other. They're right next to each other, and that's, I mean, like, that's not, that's not, like, proving anything, but I think it's indicative that, like, you know, considering how you, again, how ubiquitous it is, and I'm not doing anything to, like, try to avoid it, and, um, yeah, you know, again, like, it has to be the right species, it has to have the, the genes and the, um, but it has to secrete the enzymes that allows it to ingress into the plant. If it can't do that, like sometimes people go, scientists will go and they'll knock out the genes that let it do that, and that's how they can tell, because they're like, huh, if it doesn't produce cutinase, it can't go through the wax. So that's how that works. So that's the specific enzyme that will break down a cannabis leaf. Well, like cutin. Like so, so there's like the waxy layer, and then yeah. there's the, uh, yeah, all that. So there's like a little compound that, uh, that the fungus will... Uh, secrete or the or the, whatever pathogen bacteria whatever and um, and so that breaks down it's just like it's kind of like thinking of like acid melting through metal like you yeah. can't it, yeah you can't you can't do anything about it really um, but plants have evolved I mean they have an innate immune system that can respond generally to certain things but not in a very specific way like our immune system it's not adaptive so that's one of the yeah, yeah. Um, man, any other questions? Any other questions, guys? I know we're, I don't know, what time is it? Is it close to 11? I don't know what time it is. It is 10.55. Yeah, we have five time. minutes. Okay. You're, you're Pacific, right? Yes. Yeah, so I'm we in, have five oh, yeah. You always have, I'm in San Diego, currently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my family's from Carlsbad. Carlsbad oh, and, El Cajon. and El Cajon. Oh, I know El Cajon and Carlsbad. That's cool. <laughs> uh, best way to prevent PM. Any any suggestions? Best way to prevent it? Sure. Um, generally speaking, I like to keep it a little bit a little bit drier. If you can, I would say the best way. It's gonna like it's totally depend on the on your grow environment, right? But like if it's indoors, for example, um, you have better control of your environment, so you have so you can. Sometimes you can dictate it a little bit better. It just depends on how sophisticated your setup is. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess in in a way, one of my favorite recommendations is try to grow indoors, which I guess is sort of like not everyone can do that, and I respect that, and not everyone wants to, and that's fine. Um, if you can't do that, or if you're not trying to do that, um, the best thing you can do is to scout, is to crop scout, and know when it's going to happen, and and not let it get to a big problem, because then what you can do is you can try to like just cut off leaves. Or you can cut off things, or you can, or you can spray really quickly, and you can be on top of it because it's not about if, it's about when. Yeah. So. Well, that's what most people think. don't get. Uh, one other question: caterpillars. Best, sure. best way to deal with caterpillars outside. Oh boy, um, you know it's hard. I was just talking to somebody who was who had mentioned to me that they thought that they had um, the. Uh, Basically, the larvae will go into the the caterpillars will go into the bud. They'll like yeah, burrow they grow and they the, go down the they go down the stem. Yeah, but you know, there's not. I'll be honest. Um, whether it's corn armyworm or a bunch of other caterpillars that exist in agriculture, there's not you a lot. How much you can yeah. do? I mean, there's BT. BT does work, but I personally don't like spraying flower. That's my whole thing. Is I want to eliminate flower. Yeah, um, yeah so, that's I mean, the BT big problem. Does work. But the whole spraying and flower is the deal, right? Well, it's, and it's like the same with um, well, it's like the same with the corn, right? Like once they're in the ear, it's like you know, I guess you're gone. Like you can't, <laughs> they can't like inject the plant with the BT to make it work. Um, yeah, I, I, it's my, it's an, un, it's an unsatisfying answer, but I actually don't have a good solution. I um, struggle. If, if well, anyone yeah, has, when, if anyone has, I, a well, solution, I know a couple, a couple good, good, good things that are just normal type of things. Is keep bird feeders in your gardens outside. Birds love the damn things; they'll nail them. I like that and idea. Bat, bat boxes. Bats also eat the moths that actually lay the eggs. So uh, these are all things that I've that I old timers. Bat boxes, bird baths. Um, uh, the 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 uh, God. What's the other thing? And early morning, get up. If you're a farmer, get up in the morning and go look at your plants. Nine times out of ten in the morning, early, they're on top. They're on the top of the buds, moving around as it is already. So if you go out there and physically pluck the suckers off, I know it sounds horrible, 
Right. You know, I, I actually, that's one of my favorite advice to give to people, actually, is like, if you only have a small population, just cut the leaf off or smush them. Like, come on. Exactly. Squish the bug. <laughs> squish his head. Yeah, that's money, that's time, that's product. Just squish it up, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and I would not recommend bugs. Let me say bug zappers. I would not recommend bug zappers at all, people. You're also killing beneficial bugs. 